Welcome to Digging Deeper. I'm your host, Jason Falls. As always, it's good to have you here on the stream live on Tuesday mornings. If you are listening to the audio podcast after the live stream show, thank you for subscribing and giving us a little of your share of ear this week. If you are joining us on the live stream this morning, you're probably wondering what's going on. It looks a little different. Uh, I told you several uh, months ago that Cornette would be renovating its offices on the fourth floor of our building here in downtown uh, Lexington, Kentucky. And we technically move in a week from today, but the studio, the podcast studio, uh, was ready for me to kind of sneak in this week. So you're probably going to hear some hammering. You're probably going to hear some drilling. Uh, as always at this building, you're probably going to hear some sirens whiz by from time to time, but uh, we're in a different location and I'm oriented a little differently this week. So if I mess up a button push, or something visually, or even on the audio broadcast, you know what's going on. I'm in new digs, and everything's opposite. Like, I used to have the mic over here, and my computer over there, and now it's flip-flopped, and so I'm trying to get used to the new digs. But nonetheless, that's why things look different. If you're listening on the audio podcast, it's not going to matter to you one bit. So, But uh, we're in new digs and excited about that today. Today on the program, we're going to talk about sales, particularly B2B sales and new business pitches. If your organization has to get new clients by putting together presentations and pitch decks, our guest today says, stop it. We'll find out why Jaron Vosberg, the vice president of sales at Jump Crew, says that. Uh, the, his, his company, Jump Crew, is an acquisition marketing platform out of Nashville. They're all about helping you optimize sales. So I'm curious how that translates to no pitch decks. Uh, we're going to pick his brain a little bit and find out more about that and chat about various sales ideas with Jaron today. Stay tuned for that. All of that's coming up on Digging Deeper. Folks, have you downloaded the state of content management from Storyblock yet? I've told you about it for a couple of weeks now. You certainly owe it to your company to do so. Our friends at Storyblock surveyed 515 businesses in the U.S. and Europe, companies just like yours, to find out how they are approaching content distribution through their digital channels in 2022. So if you think about it, you've got to provide content for your website. You've got maybe a mobile app. Then there's e-commerce platforms. There's e-commerce platforms that you own and that other people own that you rent space on. There's voice activated speakers. There's social media. Managing content is more complex today than ever. So get insights and ideas on how companies like yours are tackling that content challenge with the state of the content management report from Storyblock. It's free. And just good information to make you smarter, go to storyblock.com slash digging deeper for the free report. That's storyblock without the C. They don't have a C in their name. S-T-O-R-Y-B-L-O-K dot com slash digging deeper. Storyblock, in case you're wondering, is a headless content management system rated as the number one CMS for 2022 by G2. It's also a new partner of the Marketing Podcast Network, so we appreciate their support there. But check that out at storyblock.com slash Digging Deeper, be sure to leave out the C on Storyblock. Folks, Digging Deeper is interactive. If you make it, if you're dialing into the broadcast live on LinkedIn, Facebook, YouTube, or Twitter, you can jump in the comments section there or hit at reply on Twitter to ask questions and interact with us here on the show. Jump in the comments, say hello, and ask your question. Uh, checking the plumbing today, it looks like it's working quite well. As, as usual, Chip Griffith. Uh, jumps in and says, I made it for the start of the first time in a long, for the start of the show for the first time in a long time. Yes, you did, Chip, and thank you. He also says he's relieved I explained the new set, so he didn't need to ask. So there you go. We're in the new digs. Uh, Matt Hudgens says, howdy. We've uh, talked to him on the audio version of the podcast before. He's one of the talented uh, web developers here at the Cornets. Uh, Audrey Meglin is here. She's another one of our members of the team here. She's listening in today, making things happen over at Cornet. Of course we are, Audrey. That's what we do. So uh, thank everybody for jumping in and saying hello. I always like to see some comments early on, so I know everything's working. And it looks like everything is. Uh, that de-stresses me for the rest of this. And now we're going to get to the good part because of that. So here we go. No stress is always good. So uh, we talk a lot about marketing on this program, but we don't visit the topic of sales nearly as frequently as we probably should. And certainly those two elements of your business go hand in hand. We're going to fill that gap a little bit today with Jaron Vosberg. He is the vice president of sales for Jump Crew. 
an acquisition marketing company. Knows a thing or two about sales, particularly in the B2B space. Jaron, good morning. How are you? Welcome to the show, my friend. Hey, what's up, Jason? Good morning. Appreciate you having me on. That intro got me super hyped. Uh, so super well done there, man. That's great. <laughs> I'm glad to have you. And and we're glad to learn from you today. As I, as I mentioned, you know, we don't talk about sales specifically on this show very often. We're more marketing agency, you know, content, creative executions to kind of stuff. But if there's no sales, the marketing only tees people up. There's no, nothing to close the deal. So it's good to have you here today. I want to start off by talking a bit about the specific discipline you and Jump Crew are involved in. Acquisition marketing is a term I think we can all understand just by the definitions of the, the two words. But what separates what Jump Crew does from any other software form or company out there? What are the specific needs a discipline so specific addresses? Yeah, um, I think acquisition marketing is a little buzzy for my taste. So <laughs> see if I can simplify it. If you have a product or you have a service, you got to find people to pay you for it. And that's what Jump Crew is responsible for. The two departments of marketing and sales, historically fragmented, siloed, the age old tale of marketing blaming sales and sales blaming marketing. We've eliminated that by consolidating those two responsibilities into what we'd call just revenue. And then Jump Crew is responsible for strategizing the best way in which to create a revenue game plan uh, across those two disciplines and then actually executing on that as an extension of our customers. So even more simply put, Jump Crew stands up fully dedicated, white labeled sales teams. Mm. And then we empower those sales teams by bolting on the marketing strategies that help make those sales teams effective. So for some organizations, they'll go out and subscribe to an email marketing or a CRM platform, and then they have to figure out how to build drip campaigns and all that stuff. Then they also have to go build, manage SEO and SEM and paid social. They have to keep their website running and content flowing there and organically on social. I think you guys offer all of that. Is it just your focus on customer acquisition that gives it that label or something else? Everything you've mentioned is certainly part of a holistic, and I hate using that word, but it's a good one in this case, holistic strategy for acquiring new customers. But our responsibility is to really deconstruct uh, our partner's current go-to-market strategy, their current pipeline generation strategy, their current sales strategy, and then rebuild it essentially from the ground up. And we actually execute on that uh, on their behalf. So, you know, the SEO, social media, paid media, those are all components of what we do. But Jump Crew's real differ differentiator is being able to pair those along with the actual cash component, the bottom of the funnel. So we have teams of physical salespeople ranging anywhere from four people per team to 60 and above per team. And then all here in house, we're running those mid to top of funnel activities that help to build pipeline for those sales teams to convert. In many cases, those sales teams are conducting outbound campaigns as well, which you could call outbound marketing or outbound sales depending on how you define it. Um, but all of those working together in this flywheel, especially being able to feed quantitative and qualitative feedback from sales to marketing and then marketing back to sales, continuing to improve and improve and improve and tighten that flow has definitely been a game changer for our model, which was unique, um, maybe a little um, edgy five years ago, but is seeming like almost the default option for a lot of companies right now that want to focus on their product, on their brand, on their customer and they want to find real experts to handle the revenue function. Nice. Um, you know, Chip's got a question here. I'm going to lead into his question because they, they can, the thing I wanted to ask kind of makes sense to it. You mentioned earlier that you can stand up sales teams for people. And so uh, it almost sounds to me like you're kind of an, an outsourced vendor for sales teams, if, if I'm reading that right. And then that uh, confirm or deny that for me or clarify that for me. But then Chip wants to know what kind of companies does Jump Crew work with or work for that might do that so we can kind of get a picture of where you are in the market. Yeah, I'm definitely confirmed. I think outsourced sales is probably the most simple way to put it. I think it's a little bit of a misnomer because when you say outsourced sales in that order, it makes you think, oh, I just start getting sales suddenly, which <laughs> is not the case. Like what we do is sloppy. It's difficult. It's hard. Things don't go well. We we have to solve problems every day. In fact, you'll see a lot of our of our content on our LinkedIn these days is really focusing on stories from from deep in the trenches of here was this huge problem. Here's how we tried to solve it. And here's how whether it worked or it didn't. So outsource sales, I think, is a little bit of an oversimplification. But companies in pretty much every industry and every stage of growth have worked with Jump Crew in some capacity. I'd say we're industry agnostic, although there's a couple of industries that have certainly proven to 
be a better fit for our model over the years. Um, media is certainly one of those where we're selling any kind of ad inventory, digital or otherwise. Um, automotive, which if you had told me like two years ago, I would have had no idea that automotive would suddenly become our bread and butter. Um, so we do a lot of work calling into dealerships. Um, then SaaS as an umbrella category definitely is a great fit for us. There's definitely some industries where it's a little bit more difficult. Um, historically, finance, maybe it's more of a technical product, um, although we have had some success there, especially into Fortune 5000 companies where the yield of a new opportunity is so high that our ability to navigate even slowly, very methodically will ultimately result in meaningful pipeline. Um, healthcare can be challenging just because decision makers in that industry are extremely well insulated. And so we have to temper expectations around output. I hear you chuckling because I think everybody probably knows that. <laughs> um, but I'd say that it's better to think about Jump Cruise model less in terms of industries in which we can be a good fit, but more so use cases. Mm -hmm. And so I typically think about three different use cases for Jump Cruise model. One is if you're a founding team and maybe you just got a seed round of funding or you're ramping up to your series A, you essentially need a go to market strategy and a way to throw some gasoline on customer acquisition. Mm -hmm. The second use case would be companies that have been around for a while. They know what they're good at, but probably most importantly, they know what they're not good at. Maybe they have some legacy salespeople who have have slowed down their momentum, their energy, their appetite for closing deals, and they've got big numbers they need to hit this year. And so they need a way to catalyze the activities of their sales function. And, and they turn to us to do that. And then the last would be a scenario in which they've got a playbook that they feel is working really well, and they just can't ramp fast enough. Yeah. And so we have a team of 10 full-time recruiters who build pipeline of sales reps that we can have staffed in 30 to 45 days. And that's a huge competitive advantage for us as well, for companies that just say, we just need people to get out in the field and do this. Right. I think you may have heard some of the work crews in the hallway that a drill just went off. So fun times here in the war zone of, of the new offices at Cornette for today. Um, Jaron, I've always heard an interpretation of marketing versus sales, and I don't mean to basically put them against one another, but I've always heard the differentiation being that, um, that sales is getting the customer to buy. Marketing is getting the customer to want to buy. How does that jive with you? If you had asked me that question a year ago, I think I would theoretically agree, but I've been going through a little bit of a philosophical renaissance on, on what I think that means. I actually think that a lot of the buying is happening before anyone ever raises their hand and says that they're interested in talking to somebody. And so what we've found in our experience, especially in the past six months, where we don't have the luxury, I'd call it, of being able to just profile a, an ideal client persona, to pull a lead list, to know one single problem that we're solving, and then to spray and pray outbound and use activities to drive pipeline. We could do something for almost everybody. And so crafting that narrative at a high volume is exceptionally difficult. And I think that if you're in any enterprise B2B SaaS environment, you're starting to see that that tide is changing. Everybody is so mm -hmm. protective of their digital real estate that they don't want to do anything until they've done their own due diligence to decide if they want to buy. I can give you an example. Um, I believe fundamentally that we're an intent-based business, meaning we need to be able to identify when accounts or individuals are demonstrating some level of intent to then ping my sales team and say, hey, this is somebody that's worth going after. Mm -hmm. At least that way, there's some intentionality around their outbound activities and they're not just blindly going out there and then getting really demotivated because they're not getting any results. Right. And so I started doing some research around intent-based tools that were out there. And lo and behold, a couple of days later, I actually get a message from a person at that company having never filled out a form. And they say, hey, I'm just kind of shooting in the dark here. You know, I, it looks like maybe someone at Jumpers doing some research here. would certainly love to see if I can be helpful. And mm -hmm. in that moment, when I saw that product working, um, I said, this is it. This is this is the future or probably the present. Um, and we've actually been with that vendor ever since then. Um, and it's fundamentally changed the way that we that we sell. And so that's intent. And then the other is education. Um, so these are the two most important pillars for my team right now is we have to be able to identify intent. But how do you create intent? You do it through education. And so we've been focusing on upstream content development 
to help the market understand exactly what our model is and cast a wider net as opposed to us thinking that we're just going to lean on Google AdWords and keep our fingers crossed that those perfect leads are going to come through because chances are pretty good they're not. They're just window shopping. So we need to get them to the point at which they say, all right, I'm ready to buy and now I'm just picking a vendor. And then that's what we've actually seen translate over the past couple of months. We have significantly higher intent buyers in the past, I'd say, 60 days than we ever have before. Nice. Good stuff. So for some companies out there, marketing is the lion's share of the work because they sell direct to consumer or via e-commerce. They don't have necessarily sales people per se, but for B2B brands, enterprise software companies, et cetera, the, the verticals that you were talking about earlier, um, and then also non-online purchases for consumers, you have to have sales. So give folks who don't know kind of an overview of what a proper sales function, a proper sales organization looks like and the various points of the funnel where it feeds? You know, the short, story, the short answer is that it's a little bit different for everybody. Um, that's part of the challenge that we have is that we don't have a plug and play right off the shelf. This is the model that you get. Everything is bespoke, everything is custom, and it has to be developed based on the unique needs of that, of that account. Um, it also depends heavily on the digital presence as well. For example, in some cases you have a product where um, you've got a team that's doing heavy outbound. Um, it's maybe not something that you'd raise your hand up and say, hey, I'm actually interested in learning more about this. You actually have to take the fight to them and introduce the product. And so that would be what was traditionally the sales development representative function or the business development representative function. Sometimes the distinction between those two is whether they're fielding inbound or conducting outbound, people categorize them differently, but that's one component that depending on the use case is, is very important. And then you have more the traditional account executive definition, which is I'm supposed to take this from SAO or sales accepted opportunity all the way through to a close one or a closed loss. I think the distinction between those roles is, is still relatively fair. Mm -hmm. um, but the critical component here is, is the inbound lead volume as well, because if you've got a product that you can build enough of an inbound lead funnel, high enough volume, enough transactional um, type of a sale, um, and a short enough sales cycle, then you may not need an outbound function at all. And in fact, if you can build that up market flow, it's significantly more scalable because then you're just doing ones and zeros into an algorithm on Google or on a social media platform. And you can start to just crank that number up and you only need a team of account executives who can field and close. Another component that's really important to consider is um, what is historically called account management. And I think that that's another misnomer and that that just means, oh, I'm just going to make sure everything's going OK. I'm just going to handhold this process, make sure you have the right materials. And I actually think that's fundamentally incorrect. Account management is intended in my in my uh, opinion to ultimately be responsible for increasing the average revenue per individual account. So mm -hmm. it's as much sales as it is anything else, you're selling from the moment you engage with a prospect for the first time until the day that they don't renew your contract. And that has to be the continuity throughout the organization. And so we've had instances in which we've had a sales team who's closing these transactions. And if it's maybe an MRR based or a spend based sale, that churns after a certain amount of time because maybe that client wasn't getting enough value out of the product. If you have an account management function, you could go SDR is responsible for facilitating the sales accepted opportunity. The account executive is responsible for moving it from sales accepted opportunity to close one or close lost. If close one, account management is responsible for ensuring the integrity of the product that that customer ultimately purchased. And more importantly, um, facilitating upsells and cross sells throughout the life cycle at predetermined points during the first term and beyond. And when that motion is in place, you can see a significant impact in being able to upsell internally, which I think we all know it's easier to upsell a current client than it is to sell a new one. You can offset any challenges with new business by increasing the overall value of current customers. Very nice. I like I like that explanation, and certainly it it mirrors what I've seen in the in the various organizations I've been in or worked with, where their account management team is is constantly thinking about how to grow the business. So good that the places that I've been are sort of on board here. And, and it's important to mention there too is is KPIs for account managers are fundamental. Like that can't just be this fluid role that you know, hey, make sure everything's taken care of. You know, our account managers in Jump Cruise world are KPI'd um, pretty mm -hmm. heavily and they're incentivized similar to a sales team on growing active accounts. And 
you know, before we had a model where our sales teams were actually compensated for as long as the client stuck around, but we found that that de-incentivized them from closing new business. Cause one month they could just sit back and be like, ah, you know, I've got that big client and they're going to keep paying their bill and I don't need to go out and get any new business. We drew a really hard line between new business and account management, but both functions of which are incentivized through compensation. You can see that play really well in terms of overall client growth. Nice. The main reason I wanted to have you on today is you and I were trading messages not long ago and you said you had moved away from pitch decks. For me personally, the pitch deck and or the RFP is sometimes, not always, sometimes the bane of my existence. So I need to hear this. How did that thinking come about and how did you pull that off? I have used a pitch deck pretty much every day since I started at Jump Crew. The pitch deck was intended to serve as a as a compliment to the the sale, the, the the big pitch, the demo, quote unquote. And the slides would show, here's about Jump Crew, and here's our awards, and here's why we're great, and then here's our model, and here's how it's structured, and here's what you get, and then here's what the delivery looks like, expectations, et cetera. And like, conceptually, I think the idea was good, but what we experienced that I don't think is gonna be that uncommon is that almost every time we're walking through one of those pitch decks in which the entire conversation was on our terms, it was about us, it's not custom, it would be the exact same thing. We'd say, you have any questions on this slide? And you'd hear, no, no, nope. they got, I think I'm good. I think I'm good. <laughs> I grew to hate the phrase, I think I'm good, because it meant I'm never closing this deal. They're out, dude. It's over already before we even get started. The other thing for me is I'm a stickler for details. Um, I'm a stickler for proofreading. And we are dealing with a deal size and prospects where I don't accept much margin for error. And what I found was that reps on my team would take the template deck and then they would start to customize and customize. And then they would be putting new slides in, taking old slides out. They would be putting logos or changing the name of the client. But then every so often, I'd be on a pitch. And where the client name was would either say CLIENT in mm -hmm. all caps, or it would say, God forbid, a different client, which is <laughs> humiliating. Yeah. And we found that we just had no real impact on those calls where we're almost having to mind numbingly punish these prospects into listening to this big song and dance about us. And like, who cares, dude? Like it said, nobody gives a shit about us right now. They got a problem they want to solve. And so we said, okay, if we were going to approach this in a different way, how would we do this? And so we actually spent a lot of time going through our entire sales process and seeing what comes up every single time in our sales process. What objections are always going to come up? What details, what um, collateral are they going to ask for? Um, mm -hmm. What type of deal structure do they seem to be gravitating toward? And we documented all of this. And instead of us having it in a pitch deck, we then built out what we call a, a welcome library. Um, we just did it in Google Drive, like quick and dirty. Mm -hmm. And we built all of these assets to address each and every one of these things that we know is going to come up every single sale. And we put them all into a welcome library. So then we would have the exploratory call. First one, let's do a little bit of a kind of first date, see if mm -hmm. things are going well. On this, after that call, we would share the master welcome library and say, hey, here's some information you can familiarize yourself with based on our first conversation. Here's a few things that I think you will find particularly interesting. Mm -hmm. And so maybe they said something like, oh, we've just had a really hard time recruiting and hiring. Mm -hmm. Or, you know, we've never really had much visibility into our reporting. And so that's been a huge challenge for us. So what does my rep do? Instead of walking through this generic pitch deck, they then say, hey, you mentioned recruiting and hiring is really difficult. Here's a link to our new hire website where you can see every new hire that we've brought on over the past two years with bios and links to their LinkedIn page. Give you a little bit of visibility into who we're actually hiring. Mm -hmm. You also said accountability and reporting was really challenging. I have a whole folder here that shows some of our weekly reporting decks that you're going to get with your sales manager who's going to go through all the activities of the team. I think this will be really helpful for you to visualize what that's like when you're actually working with Jump Crew. Yep. And so we really leaned into this approach. And we almost throttle it a little bit at the beginning where we'll just show one or two resources specifically because like right now in Google Drive, I don't have much visibility into who's actually cooking on what. But as you get deeper and deeper into the sales process, my team is able to get deeper and deeper into the welcome library and make it more and more and more specific. We've recorded about 10 of those stories that I mentioned of um, leaders on our delivery side who are actually standing up these teams talking about 
I had this challenge with the CRM or we had an outside sales team and we had to transition them to inside. Here was this big issue with this telecom client, et cetera, et cetera. And then my sales team now can pull this and say, hey, I think this example is really useful for you as you think about our experience in this space or our experience with this problem. Mm -hmm. And what we found is that it starts to feel like we're building a quote unquote pitch deck specific to the client. And it's fundamentally changed the way in which we close. We had an 18% close rate before when we had a pitch deck. We have a 38% close rate today after getting rid of it. Wow. That's the, that's proof is in the numbers on that one. That's great. So I, I, my follow-up question was, how does this all work out when you're, when you're in a pitch, but you just kind of explained it to me that it's really, you know, you're building a, a library of components that you put in based on the client, which is super smart. And of course, with all the shared drives these days, it makes a lot of sense. I think my biggest, you know, sort of frustration that I've run into is that, and I wonder if this is a problem because you've got this library, but you still have to customize things to the client. And the customization is the important part, um, but it's also, in my mind, sometimes the frustrating part. Does anybody have the temptation to say, okay, here's the welcome library, but I only want this part and this part, so I'm going to pull that out and make my own slides or make my own something over here. Is, 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 it, is, there, is the temptation there for people to still do what they used to do, which is I'm going to tinker with it and customize the hell out of it, which can sometimes be counterproductive? I have told my team that anything that lives in the welcome library is free to use in whatever way you think will be the most effective at getting the deal done. Okay. And, and they run with it. Now there is a level of customization that some of them have been using. And this is more on a case by case basis where instead of doing a pitch deck, we have um, what we'd call like a takeaways deck mm -hmm. and it's only four or five slides. Um, the first slide is literally just that it is takeaways. We use, um, you know, a note taker, a call recorder, all of my reps, as soon as they get off a call that they think is decent, they'll go back and they'll listen to the call recording and then they'll strip out some of their key takeaways directly out of the mouth of our prospect, which, by the way, is one of the most impactful things you can possibly do in the sale. Because if you can say something that that person just said as a flyaway comment and mm -hmm. you can put a spotlight on it and show not only did I hear you, but I can read between the lines on what you're really trying to say here and here's some information to lean into about that topic, th their minds are blown. Like they, I've literally had people say, oh, I can't believe you remembered that. Right. Um, we didn't. We just listened through a call recording. Um, and they put that on the takeaway slides, like takeaway one, you're responsible for the new go-to-market strategy in the U.S. after having success in Europe. Takeaway number two, you're responsible for building out a team. You only have one person on your staff right now, and there's no way to track their KPIs. And they're just like, mm -hmm. take away, take away, take away. So then on the next slide, if they, again, if they feel like this is something they want to use, then they'll do um, a, a kind of summary overview of the opportunity. So sometimes they'll do that categorically. Like we're going to be targeting this ICP. We're going to be targeting this type of company. And this is the problem that we're solving. Now with that in mind, here are, conceptually the tactics that I think best align with this mm -hmm. opportunity. And so that's a way of us starting to really build the proposal on the fly, but it's still being very loose, very fluid. And then from there, they'll have a slide that'll show general pricing and here's how it's structured. Now, this is meant to be very conversational. Every step of the way, the question is, does this feel like I'm on the right track or do you want to approach this differently? Those types of questions make those conversations exceptionally collaborative. And it feels like we're building this team together as opposed to us being, here's our products and services and here's the features and benefits and here's all the great things that are going to happen. It's very stripped down very candid and very conversational. Very nice. So if people wanted to find out more about you or Jumps, uh, Jump Crew, where uh, on the interwebs would they find you? LinkedIn. We have been prioritizing LinkedIn pretty heavily over the past few months. Um, we are putting out some of those stories on a regular basis. Um, we just launched a LinkedIn Live series called Things We Effed Up. Um, which is where we're going to be talking to leaders in various different industries about all the mistakes that they made and failing forward. We found that conversations like that are so much more meaningful than us getting up on a soapbox and talking about our philosophy and why we're great. And here's all of our methods to our madness. We just want to have conversations about solving problems. Um, and so that's actually going to be starting today. Um, and then our LinkedIn page, the Jump Crew page has 20,000 followers right now, and we're growing pretty significantly every week. So that would be a great place to stay in tune with the content that we have. Every so often, I'll put some garbage out there on my own personal profile, <laughs> mostly about my Panda Express obsession and my friends texting me for advice on what to order. Um, but uh, um, LinkedIn is definitely the best place to get acquainted with us. 
Very nice. Well, we'll make sure that your LinkedIn profile and uh, Jump Crew's website and uh, LinkedIn profile are uh, in the show notes uh, over at teamcornet.com afterwards. Jaron, thanks so much for the time today. Appreciate you helping us get smarter on sales. And uh, hopefully we'll have you back at some point to check in. It was awesome, Jason. Thanks, man. All right, Jaron. Have a good day. You too. Jaron Vosberg. Uh, from Jump Crew. We'll uh, make sure those links are all there on the show notes. Uh, I would you know, say that we'll share them in the social media things, but I think our broadcast has actually dropped out. Uh, so if you were watching and came back to the recording, thank you for doing so. Uh, but jump over to teamcornet.com and click on news to find this episode or the short, uh, short code, code uh, URL to get there is cornet.online slash Jaron Vosberg. His name, J-A-R-R-O-N. V O S B U R G. Um, we'll have some other notes and links and whatnot in there for you as well. So good stuff. Folks, don't forget there are now audio exclusive episodes of Digging Deeper available only on the audio podcast subscription. Certainly, we publish the audio from this live stream so you can listen on demand if you ever miss the show. But we've begun producing and adding some bonus episodes just for the audio listeners. Subscribe to the audio podcast by visiting cornet.online slash digging deeper. Uh, or searching for Digging Deeper Cornet wherever you get your podcasts. If you do subscribe on Apple Podcasts, Spotify, Stitcher, or anywhere else, please jump in there and give us a review, won't you? We prefer five stars, but that's your call. We would love the feedback. Next week, we're going to dig into part of the blockchain and NFTs that is concerning to many their environmental impact. Matt Rickard from Taskio and the Blue Marble, an NFT marketplace where Creators can share proceeds with social and environmental causes will be with us. Not all blockchains are bad with massive carbon footprints. We'll learn more about which are not and talk about some other ideas on how your brand can leverage NFTs and more in interesting ways that are pro-sustainability and pro-Earth and all that good stuff. That'll be next Tuesday, April 19th at 11 a.m. Eastern, 8 a.m. Pacific. If you can't be there live, subscribe to our YouTube channel at cornet.online slash deep. Or and to watch the replay on demand, or of course, as we mentioned earlier, you can always get the audio podcast at cornet.online slash digging deeper. And that's going to uh, wrap up our first show from the new digs. Obviously, a little technical difficulties today, but we'll iron all those out and make sure things are better for you in the future. We certainly do thank you. Uh, for tuning in. That'll do it for this edition of Digging Deeper. If you like the episode, share it with a friend or colleague who might as well. Digging Deeper is a production of the Cornette Group. Find us online at teamcornette.com. Our executive producer is Christy Heiler. Creative director is Jason Majeski. Our theme music is composed by Rex Banner. I'm your host, Jason Falls. Until next time, I'll see you on the interwebs. <laughs> <laughs>